the magic word is intent where people state their intentions. Now, and in, in, in you're in the middle of a, a very time critical thing, you might skip it. You say, starting an IV, uh, administering the, the following drug, commencing CPR. You might not say, I intend to commence CPR, but you're announcing it, pause, doing it. And the pause can be microseconds. But, but the idea was with intent, you're doing it, you own it, the initiative comes from you, the spark comes from you, the responsibility lives with you, you can't dodge it, and, but there's this bias for action and, there, and we remove the latency from people waiting to be told what to do. Hi folks, I'm Dan Dworkis and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. All right, folks, I am really excited about this episode. Our guest is Captain David Marquet. Now, David is a world-renowned leadership expert, the former captain of a nuclear-powered submarine, the USS Santa Fe, and he's the best-selling author of both Turn the Ship Around and Leadership as Language. Now, I'm a huge fan of David's work in intent-based leadership, and in this conversation, we're going to dig really deeply into how to lead effectively under pressure. Specifically, we're going to talk about red work and blue work, optimizing decision-making, harnessing the wisdom of the room, and we're going to get really deep into what this idea of intent-based leadership is. I think there is an absolute ton of gems in this one, and I think you're going to love it. Before we start the episode, a reminder to check out the new Emergency Mind book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure. Now, like the podcast, it's a deep dive into the mental models and tools it takes for individuals and teams to perform at their absolute best in times of crisis and emergency. You can find it on Amazon, and you can learn more at emergencymind.com book. Okay, all that said, let's jump into the episode. I hope you enjoy. David, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I, I'm, I'm honored to have you. I'm a huge fan of your work, and I have my dog your marked copy of Turn the Ship Around right here next to me. Um, I'm, I'm jazzed to talk. Great. Hey, thanks, Dan, for having me on your show. What, what you guys do is so important. I made two trips to the emergency room last month. I'm not super proud of it, but uh, mm. it's always very comforting to know that I, can, I get in there, get quality care, and just somehow walking in the door, I feel better. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see you alive and vertical. That's always a, a positive outcome. <laughs> vertical, that's my, that's my objective for the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so for folks that don't know you as well, I was wondering if we could start, can you give us just a quick rundown of what intent-based leadership is? And, and we're going to sort of dovetail that into how it applies to emergency situations. Intent-based leadership is a magical solution to all your problems. <laughs> <laughs> I was a nuclear submarine commander. I came up through the Navy with a uh, protocols for how we operated, which were so deeply ingrained, I didn't realize there were choices behind them. For example, uh, the world was divided into two groups of people, the people at the top who did the thinking, made decisions, and the people around them who executed those decisions. So this leader, follower, management, union, doctors, staff, uh, it's embedded in the, in the culture. Number two, um, that basically you're supposed to do what you're told. Yeah, there's a little asterisk that says, but you know, if you really think it's wrong, speak up. But the big arrow is do what you're told. Consensus is rewarded. Uh, outlying opinions, dissenting opinions are, are looked at with a scant. Why? Because it typically slows down the action. Hey, wait a minute. We're about to pick up the SEAL team. Hey, wait a minute. We, um, I'm not sure about something. No, no, come on. We talked about this. And then, oops. Gee, I wish I'd listened to you. So, and, and thirdly, is the lead, the role of the leader is to make decisions and get the team to do it. Oh, oh yeah, sure, of course. Um, wrong. I ended up going to a submarine at the very last minute that I wasn't trained for. It was a different kind of submarine, submarine I'd never been on. It was one of the newest submarines in the fleet. And so I show up as the captain with the full expectation that I'm going to know all the answers and give everyone orders. And they're expecting to be told what to do. Now they know I've been, that the reason was their captain quit. And I got air dropped in on them after I completed training for another ship. So like an idiot, like a programmed human being, I give, start giving orders. And the, one of the very first orders I give didn't make any sense. It didn't hurt anybody. But it was the equivalent of saying, hey, shift the car into sixth gear, but it only had five gears, that kind of a thing. And so the sailor kind of looked at me funny and whatever. Came to light, and I looked at the officer 
because truly as a captain, I just kind of suggested it. I didn't really order it. That's <laughs> my excuse. Look at the officer and say, hey, why did you, did you know this? Yes, sir, I did. Why? Why'd you do it? Because you told me to. And at that moment, my 20 years of naval leadership and naval experience became irrelevant because I realized that all my training was about getting people to do stuff, that I was the source of genius. They were the source of action, following my genius. And what I realized was I, the problem wasn't I made a bad decision. The problem was I was the decision maker. And I wanted to create an organization that decoupled my the foibles of myself as a human being with the performance of the organization. I needed 135 people, thinking, active, thinking, passionate people. So I got the team together. And I, I have to tell you, like my instinct was to give the same BS speech that I'd heard. You're empowered. You should speak up. You have the power to stop the thing from happening, but you can raise your hand. And what's the key word there? You, you, you. You're all the ones that need to have you. You are all the problem. You all need to change. I'm fine. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. This is wrong. It's all you, like, is yourself. You can only control yourself, but it's hard. So rather than do that, I'm going to take a mental shortcut. I'm just say, oh, no, no, I can't control how I run the operation. So therefore, I'm just going to give you a lecture that you should speak up, even though I'm not asking the questions and I'm not comporting myself in a way that really invites you to speak up. And I spent the next three years on the submarine working day and night to reprogram every single conversation, every single interaction I have with the people on my team. Because over and over and over again, I learned the ship. It was a different kind of ship, but I, I eventually learned it. And then my instinct was, oh, now I can stop wasting time. I can stop asking them what they think. I can just go back that we can be more expeditious. But I'd seen the eruption. What happens is, uh, you, and it all happens through language. You don't need to buy software. You don't need to do anything. We call it pushing the authority for decisions to where the information is native, not the other way around, which is the traditional hierarchical approach. And we set records for the performance. We set records for morale and retention. And then 10 years later, uh, we set a record, which was not known to most people because we don't keep records like this, but we had 10 submarine commanders from the one ship because we were building leaders, not followers, not doers, and a bias for action and ownership lived in the team. And we made so many fewer mistakes. Uh, we tried to make same, same number of mistakes, but they just didn't happen because we had a resilient self-correcting system where we trapped those errors before they propagated through the system. So I become this... Uh, and the magic is intent. The magic word is intent, where people state their intentions. Now, and in, in, in you're in the middle of a, a very time critical thing, you might skip it. You say, starting an IV, uh, administering the, the following drug, commencing CPR. You might not say, I intend to commence CPR, but you're announcing it, pause, doing it. And the pause can be microseconds. But, but the idea was with intent, you're doing it. You own it. The initiative comes from you. The spark comes from you. The responsibility lives with you. You can't dodge it. And, but there's this bias for action and, there, and we remove the latency from people waiting to be told what to do, which is the, that's what saves lives. That, that is so awesome. And there's so many parallels there that, that jump out at me in terms of what we're trying to do in the emergency department. And we get trained, most of us, in the same sort of hierarchical structure that you're describing, right? There's a single doctor and that doctor sort of owns the room. And yeah. then you push tasks and you sort of ask questions and push authority in various places. Yeah, which... we call that, yeah, we push, we're pushing, we, we, we channel information to the authority figure and so people are reporting, it's called direct and report. We use that phrase, right? They report and then it's direction. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. Yeah. Sorry and, for and jumping in. I no, got no, too no. excited. Absolutely. <laughs> of course. No, there's, there's so much richness in this. And so, so that idea of like, of 
maybe there's an alternate better way to do some of this work that applies itself both to routine operations of day-to-day -day sort of either functioning on the submarine or functioning in an emergency department, and also in the most critical time-sensitive moments in these code situations or um, you know, in these crises moments is such a fascinating thing to me because what you're just describing this, this idea of intent based action. And, and actually I want to push on that one more time. So what you said and what we were discussing a little bit earlier before we hit the record button was that the idea is that you say, basically I intend to do X and then you pause briefly and then failing anybody telling you not to, you do X. And that simple sort of incredibly radical act really changes the way that, that basically everything else is done. Am, am I reading that right? Exactly. Every, once we started doing this, we I realized everything that we did was upside down. The way we ran meetings, the way we did one-on-ones, the way we wrote end-of-year reports, the way we, we, we wrote our quarterly objectives, the way um, just like everything we did in management, because this, this thing of, well, people at the top tell people below them what to do is so pervasive, it colors everything. It's a coercive form. I'll give you a couple quick examples. Uh, you're on the road. So, um, the, so you're on, so, so imagine you have a multi-lane highway and, you, and there's a bunch of cars and you have to design the system by which the cars interact. Now your choice is you could say, well, just do it leadership is cars will just move from lane to lane without, so, I got irritated because I was following a guy the other day in traffic. He, he successfully um, changed lanes four times and made two turns without ever using his turn signal, like miraculous. So, <laughs> pet peeve. Anyway, sorry. But welcome so, to Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. Or we use our turn signal, and we will wait three clicks or whatever, and then we go. Um. Or I, that's what intent is. I wait through, no one's honking, no one honks. So they, they, I must not have someone in my blind spot. Or I turn on my turn signal. I wait for all the cars around me to tell it's okay. And then I change lanes. That's what most, that's what a permission-based organization is like. It's designed to stop action. It's literally the purpose is so that nothing happens. Because in order to get everyone to say yes, that's the perfect way to have nothing happen. So what you want to do is have the default be yes, unless someone sees an objection. And we say, uh, I heard this phrase the other day, something like, is it good enough? Um, good enough for now, safe enough to try. So mm -hmm. it, it's not... It's, we're not claiming this is the best solution for the end of time, but right now, the, the key is to get the bias for action to live in the team. And then it separates you. Because because for me as a submarine commander, and I'm guessing it's kind of the same, if you're a doctor and you're managing a, a very critical situation, the, the, you're in it. So that that's one thing I think is a little bit different, is, is you're actually, you're cutting or you're clamping and, and like you're part of the action for me i was able to be a little bit more aloof but what you it's much easier to evaluate a decision from a psychological point of view that someone else made and you can see the errors in it once you make the decision your ego attaches to the decision and that becomes part of your what your ego will then defend it. And it's not up to you at that point your brain will conjure up all these even if it starts looking bad your brain will justify the decision. It will say, well, you know, we need to wait a little bit longer. Oh, we're not really sure. Oh, well, this really could be something else, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so if you're the most senior person in the room, you don't want to be the decision maker. You want to be the, you want the next tier below you making decisions and you can evaluate and coordinate and they will coordinate amongst themselves if they vocalize it. Yeah, so when we, when we train or when I trained to do, um, 
to run cardiac arrest, to run codes, right? Yeah. Or to run a complicated trauma case. So you usually train with multiple doctors on your team, multiple people from varying skill sets. And you'll train to have one person stand at the foot of the bed to sort of be the, the head, the leader, and then one person to be the chief sort of proceduralist. And that person will do the intubation or put the chest tube in or sort of run the stuff. And so you'll try as much as possible to divide that leadership like that Perfect. and and to divide the person who holds the whole mental model and sort of synthesizes across the room from what any one action is doing. Now, yeah. that works when you have that type of team. So sort of right after graduating from residency, one of the first places I ended up working was a place where, depending on the type of the, the time of the day, I would be the only doctor in the entire hospital, let alone in the resuscitation room. And so all of a sudden, you're thrust into this position where not only are you supposed to be sort of having the mental model and holding the thread, but you're also the one doing the intubation and doing the procedure. And you're sort of jumping back and forth between mindsets. And that got me incredibly interested in this idea of how do you strengthen every single person around you on your team? How do you get them to have more capability and stronger skill sets? And also the desire and ability to activate those skill sets independently and, and synergistically, which I yeah. think is why the, what you're talking about is so interesting from that perspective. And and you know, I didn't have this idea of intent-based leadership when I was working at that facility, but we tried to run drills that were similar to that, where you're trying to get folks to recognize where they're going. Um, and I wonder if this is a good time to, to pivot slightly into the idea of how was this, how was this perceived by the people that you were working on it with? Like, what, like this is obviously a little bit different than what they'd been used to. You're trying to say, hey, I want you to do this different style where you are action oriented and moving forward, and you're seeing yourself not as somebody passively waiting, but as somebody who's actively driving part of the ship. In some cases, quite literally, in your case. And how was that perceived? What what did that what did that look like? Yeah. Well, let me, let me go back to the other thing for a Please, second. Yes. So when you so so this is from a corporate perspective it costs more to have the three uh like on a cruise ship okay the captain makes all the decisions it's it's that's why they keep having accidents and that's why they're still going to keep having accidents because the chief you know, the officers aren't going to counterman the captain except in you know extreme cases we want to think they will but they won't so to have three basically you need three people qualified to be captains who serve as a sec when their watch is on. Uh, and then the captain sort of being dispassionate about it. If you, if you don't have that luxury, then what you do it by time, you have, you create a temporal space. So you're the, the problem is you requires two different ways to use your brain. When you're in the action, you you're hyper-focused. And then we've all had this experience where like, I think I, whole, it's 45 minutes, whole, where did, how'd that go by? Or something's happening like next to you, you don't even know it. Cause you, so then you have to pause and, and you're the person who needs to do it as the leader. You say, okay, hold on, what are we missing? Well, what's next? How does everyone feel? Uh, What's the, uh, th those kind of things. And then you, now you look left and you raise your head, you look left and right, you take a breath, da, 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 and then you can make a decision, go back into it. When Sullenberger was landing in the Hudson, they got the double bird strike, both engines go down. They go through this very, the, 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 now they're in, we, we call this uh, red work. You're in the, they're fo very focused, seeing the co-pilot, starting both engines, can't get them to start. He's looking at the map, trying to figure out where they can land. And then he shifts to blue work and he says, what am I, any ideas? He, he, like they literally raise their head up and like, okay, now, and he, he doesn't say we good. Like, I'm right. We're okay. Right. We're like, in other words, we're not asking a question to affirm what I already believe. I'm asking it disconfirming. Hey, where am I? Okay. What could, what, how could we be reading this wrong? How could, it, how could this situation be different than what I'm interpreting? Uh, and what, what th those kind of questions. So make it easy for the team to kind of come up and say, so one of the supporting people says, yeah, well, some happened. I'm thinking that there's also a possibility it's this. Um, it's, it's not, uh, anyway. So, so what happened on the, on the submarine, uh, it varied. Some people were super enthusiastic. They just jumped in. They were like, get out of the way, old man. I'm gonna, yeah. And they would, and then that kind of cascaded out from there. 
And then we had some people who weren't so enthusiastic. And here's the key. You pay no attention to them. You don't put any energy into them. Uh, there's a difference between someone who's honestly giving a dissenting opinion, like I should, I think we should go south rather than north, versus a person who says, "Yeah, I don't know, convince me that really this is really like." No, I'm not. I don't care. Don't waste my time. I'm not going to talk to you. Or literally, I just wouldn't talk to him. I wouldn't even say that. I would just walk away. <laughs> because talking to someone is paying attention to someone. Paying attention to someone is a reward, and you'll get more of whatever you reward. So if you're rewarding people from being if you're running people who are being cynical pain in the neck just because they're fear-based and they don't want to stick themselves out you don't punish them you still love them but you don't reward them and i would say and i just go in the meantime you have these people over here they're all trying really hard to do it so you go you go talk to them you work with them Eventually, those people will convince these people or not, or they'll leave. Yeah. So I, I love this idea of red work and blue work, because I think that's such an important concept when we're in the middle of something and sort of running a code or a cardiac arrest. And some of it's baked in, right? If you look at the ACLS algorithms, right, you have these two minute chunks where you do CPR and then you pause briefly to look at the rhythm and then you do CPR. And I think part of the part of the magic and also the danger of that is that when you're just starting and you're you're starting to train on this, it all looks like red work to you like the CPR and the pause, the rhythm and the start, the next CPR and the do the thing. And it's just red, red, red. And so I, I think a lot about the first cardiac arrest I ever ran as a team leader. Mm -hmm. And I think about how it just like this idea that my patient's heart had stopped and therefore mine had to go as fast as possible all the time, which is yep. a, ter a terrible idea and not at all about how I run cardiac arrest these days. And the more senior I've gotten and the more experience I have, the more important it is for me um, and something I teach the, the folks I'm lucky enough to work with now to find that rhythm. And I've never said it this way, but, but maybe I'm going to start doing that now to do that blue work, to put your head up and really, really, really step back from the grind to make sure you're pointed yourself in the right, in the right direction. Um, it, it, ex exactly. And so th this is what my next book, the leadership is language is all about is, is that you need two different languages at work. And if you, and, and most organizations don't differentiate and it does look like red work. I would always call it, we just, all we're doing, I would ask my people, what decisions did you make today on there? You had stood six hours a while. What, well, no, I just did what I, you know, I just did what was on the schedule or like what decisions did you make this week? Or, and, and so some people just view, they don't, they're not, they don't see the agency that they have. Uh, so, you know, we have tons of stories in the submarine force. There was another submarine they were driving into a um, uh, Pacific Atoll late at night to go uh, pick somebody up or drop somebody off and um, early in the morning. So they were surfacing, they were running behind, they're kind of rushing to get the charts set up and the ship's on the surface, which is an uncomfortable place for a submarine. And they're driving, they get the buoys lot wrong and they go on the wrong side of the buoy and they run aground. And, the Navy, you know, we do an investigation. We find all these 57 nitpicky things that they did wrong. Okay, great. But we don't really understand. We don't address the fundamental thing, which is the ship never made a decision to go into port. At no point did the captain say, all right, time out. We're not a point for a decision. Now, the question is, how do you run that? The next 30 seconds. Doesn't right. need to take long. You could say, worst way. I think we're all good to go. This is how 737 max. Hey, we're good to go. You know, we've done all the testing. Um, Airbus is getting ahead of us. So how are we feeling? Like exactly 0, 0.0 people are going to say, no, we shouldn't do it. So you say, um, how are we feeling? And, and we would have a thing very quickly with our hands. Zero to five. Boom. Hands. Boom. And then I look for the zeros and the fives. Hey, engineer, you got a zero. Tell me. Well, blah, blah, blah. This is what I see. Okay, great. You look for the outliers. You don't discuss it. So you vote first, then you discuss it. You don't discuss it first. That just anchors the group and gets people to, to, to put you in an echo chamber. So now you have a decision. 
Now, teams don't make decisions. Individuals make decisions. So now you have to make a decision. If it's something that like one person owns, like maybe the operations officer owns it. So then the operations officer can make the decision. But if it's in general, um, I, I, I don't think teams make decisions. I think ind individuals make decisions. And, and once you understand that, um, you can design, design a system which takes advantage with the input of the team. So hands, boom, one, zero to five. I, I can see, I can see that happening every two minutes. Like, how are we doing? Like, how are we doing? And then someone shows a different yeah. hand signal on a construction site. Every morning we do the same, we have the same ridiculous, worthless ritual, which is the foreman get out there and say, well, I'm required to do a safety brief. So blah, blah, blah. Everyone be safe. We good to go. I've never seen, we have a, couple of big construction companies as clients. I, I, I've never, ever seen anyone say no. Huh. Mostly they say nothing because they know it, it's a bullshit question. It's not really, no one really cares because now the, your, your choice is up arrow or down arrow. But if you just go zero to five, like it's okay to send show a four. So now I'm asking the questions. I show the team, how safe are we today? Fives, say how safe are we? Fives, how safe are we today? Fives and fours, maybe a three. Hey, what's going on? Well, you know, I see the uh, winter storms coming in. We're going up to a higher floor on the building. We're shifting over from concrete to wood. And I got three new people on the team. Oh, but it was only because you asked a question in the way that invited mm -hmm. that nuanced response. Did you hear? If you just said, are we safe? No, like that means nothing. Is the COVID vaccine safe? That is a meaningless question. Absolutely. How safe it is it? Now that question has meaning. Hmm. Man, I, I love that. It, so there, there's two points in time that really jump out at me right as we're talking about this. One is uh, a ritual that we always have already, which is, which is essentially a formal timeout, right? The moment yeah. that we take before we start a procedure of one form or another. And the second is the moment at the end of a code when we decide uh, that there is nothing else to do and we call mm. the person dead. And uh, these are two obviously very crucial moments in, yeah. in our life and in their life. And they both have this sense of what you're describing around them, which are the, they're these big pivotal moments where, in, where a, um, a decision is being made, but it's not always brought up to the level where it has to be about the type of decision and how we're making the decision. So if you watch us do a timeout, what's required, and this is obviously very important, is that we identify that it's the correct patient, the correct procedure, the correct part of the patient, and then we have you know whatever tools we need. So that's, so that's like very good and very important, obviously, but I think misses part of the point of what you're saying, because it doesn't really give people the chance to dig into making sure that everybody's on the same page, that this is what we should be doing. Not necessarily, are we doing the right procedure? So this idea of, well, how confident are we that this is the right thing to do and we'll fix this problem? Yeah. Kind of a better way to ask that almost. Yeah. So I've, I've seen my, I've been party, I've been operated on, I've seen medical teams kind of go through that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen my own team do similar kinds of things. And most of them are bullshit. It's just a pro forma head mm -hmm. nod. And I can check it off that we did the thing. And oh, yeah, I went through this six factor questionnaire. Uh, I'm asking a bunch of binary questions. And the the problem is there's a default answer, which is we're going to go forward. In my, when I do keynotes, and if we get, end up talking about this, the key, the difference is you have to say no every once in a while. If it, so, so in other words, like if a person shows up with bullet, bullet holes, the, you don't get the option to say, no, I got it. But if you're going in for cosmetic surgery or some elective thing, you can say we're not ready. I, 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 and now maybe you have an experience of this, but I ask people, hey, has anyone ever gone to a scheduled medical procedure where they came out and told you they, they weren't ready? No, no one has ever raised their hand to that, which means that we're not making a decision. It's just, we're just doing the, 
hey, 10 o'clock, Marquet comes in for his whatever. No one, is, no one ever says, yeah, I got a new person. I'm not quite comfortable with what this is. We're going to have to have you come back next week. Right. We, right. So that's the, that's the test to see if we're actually making a decision or are we just executing the next turn? Now, the, oh, well, look how much money it's going to cost. And we booked the OR and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Guess what? That's where courage comes from. That, or you can do the wrong procedure. Your yeah. Choice. No, absolutely. And I think that when, when we do go through timeout periods, um, where they are productive and useful, because even in the setting of like person comes in with bullet holes, there's still, you're still not always really forced to act in the way that it might feel like you are right at the beginning. And mm. the, the more comfortable and, and strong and creative your team is, the more you realize there's space for movement and thinking and rhythm, even in these like crazy life or death cases. Yeah. Yeah. So the times that I'm, that I'm thinking of, and I'm thinking of a particular case that happened a couple of, couple of years ago now, where we were all set up to do a procedure and in our timeout recognized a couple of deficiencies in how we, it was a new kit and we weren't really sure if the right components were in it and made the decision. Okay. Is it life or death? Like, do we have to do this with this kit on this person right now? And, and actually came up with the answer. No, we don't. We can pause slightly and sort of see. So we, we took a step back, found a different kit. And actually over the course of this one shift, we did not do a procedure on this one patient five times in a row. Because huh. every time something came up because the equipment was wrong or we couldn't find the right piece or the operator was there or there's some other pressing thing that have to happen. And in talking with my my very senior, very skilled resident after that day, one of the biggest things that we came out with was, was asking ourselves the question, was this a victory or not? Mm. What happened here? Was this a victory? Because the person never got a chest tube. They survived clearly and, and had no bad outcomes from it and everything Good. was fine from that perspective but was it a victory and coming to the conclusion that yes it was a victory because of the logic and the thought process and the drill that we went through in terms of figuring it out and the what you described as, as courage i'll also add the word sort of like rigorous honesty to that to say that like if you're really being truthful with yourself you're going to answer no to this question some of the time you're going to realize you don't have the right backup equipment and you're going to have to pause and sort of regroup it. But but how do you create from, from the leadership perspective, from the team member perspective, from all of these different angles, how do you create a space that is safe enough to view that as a victory, not a failure? Yeah, so there's, I'm thinking of a couple things. Um, first off is... Is there's the Krakauer's book into thin air. He's talking about these guys going up on Everest and they, and they, and they have this, um, as they're approaching the summit, they have a two o'clock turnaround time, but it's, the summit's right there. And it's two 30, three, three 30. And, and, um, and, the, and they're, as you're going up to the summit, you're moving, I think in a Northwesterly direction, the storm was coming in from the Southeast. So it was like behind them and they weren't noticing it kind of a thing. And then there's more, there was one of the, one of the people uh, on the expedition was a postal worker who had saved all those, it's like 60 grand to go and went last year and then got within basically side of the summit and the team leader had turned him around. And so now he's there again with the team leader and so they're pushing it and your ego, your ego is designed to, to keep pushing you at that point. And it's really, really hard to say, no, we're going to, we're going to turn around. And one of the things for me that mitigates that is we, we tend to measure success or failure in life along a single vector. And the vector is performance. It's how many operations do we do? How many lives do we save? How many blah, blah, blah. But there's another vector, which I would argue is equally important, which is our learning vector. What did we learn? And so the learning, but when you activate the learning vector, you can come short on the performance vector, but if you have the learning, it mitigates it. So what happens is you're less likely to push in an area where you really need to pull back. And it frees you, like, would you say, oh, my goal is to run a 330 marathon. 
and then I run a 340 or my, ah, oh, no, that's too hard. My goal will be to run a four hour marathon and then I run a 350, like which is better. And so, but, but if I say, well, I don't want to say 330 because if I don't, then I feel so bad about myself. I hang my head and I'm a failure, but it's like, well, what did I like? First of all, my net score performance is better, but like, what did I learn? But it's all, it's, it's these relative things. What was now that was, what was your question again? <laughs> Dan? <laughs> no, 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 we got, we got into it for sure. I, I think the question is, is creating a culture that, that values, the honesty and courage yeah. and rigor it takes to to back off which yeah. I, you know yeah. we're all action oriented humans right people that work on submarines right. people that work in the er we get after it because we love to but okay. to create that space that values the the pause and the learn and the rhythm i think is is so crucial so the, here's a way not to do it Give everyone a lecture and say, oh, this is a valuable space where you value everyone's integrity and everyone's opinion, blah, 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 blah. That is a waste of time. That is predicated on what most change programs are predicated on, which is what I call thinking our way to new action, which is not the way humans are designed. Humans act their way to new thinking. So for example, it's the act of speaking up, which gives you the feeling of empowerment, not, oh, I, I dub all the empowered, Therefore, then we speak up. So the question we would ask is, okay, describe that environment. And then I would sit down with my team and say, well, now what would, it, what would this actually sound like? Like, let's take a script. We, 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 we would take a script from doing like loading torpedo or shooting a, a tor missile or whatever. And we say, what it would sound like if it's done perfectly? Mm. And we would just put those words down. And then, uh, and, th and we said, well, now, and then we would inject the cultural component. Okay, now where would the timeouts happen? What would they sound, what exactly would you say? Would you say, is everyone okay? Or would I say, how does everyone feel? And we would argue about that. And people say, well, wow, that is really detailed. Yeah, well, you want the best performing team on the planet? You don't just do what everyone else does because then you'll just get the same mediocrity as everyone else has. So the question is, what would it sound like if? Now you have some words. And then what you do is you practice the words. You go to the team and you start with you. You can only control yourself. The problem with modern, the problem with modern management is it's basically misaligning what we can control and what we what we're trying to control. So I'm I'm trying to control somebody else, which I can't, and someone else is trying to control me, which feels like crap. So we, we want to align. So you start by focusing your control on yourself. So the question is, how do I ask the question in such a way that in, it invites that kind of a response from the team? And those words can, you can work with your team to come up with those words. Okay, now, so then if I ask the question this way, what kind of answers do, like what's, what's a better answer? What's a uh, worse answer? That kind of thing. And then they can practice their part. And it's through practice that that culture builds. And then six months later, you don't even realize and someone will come in and say, man, you got such a, 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 a culture of integrity and people speaking truth to power. And you'll, you'll like, we don't talk about a culture of speaking truth to power. We, we have a protocol that we, we use the following language in our, in our, in our timeouts and our blue space. And I, I love that. And I'm thinking immediately about that moment when you're called up to a situation, a, a space where you're not familiar and you have to run a, a cardiac arrest. And one of the things we work a lot with our residents about is what do you say in those first couple seconds? Yeah. When you walk in the room and you're taking command of the situation and you're looking for what's going on. And, and I'll often have them uh, say out loud, either to me or just to themselves over and over again, what do you say in those first couple minutes and just practice it and visualize it? And where are you standing and where's the weight on your shoulder and where's yeah. the patient, where's the everything. And to me, that was one of the biggest things to get over the hump of saying, okay, well, as I'm going from a, you know, a PGY two to a PGY three. So all of a sudden I'm going to start running the codes myself. I'm going to start running the traumas myself. Well, I, man, I spent hours just visualizing myself standing there saying those first couple words yeah. and how it came out. Perfect. I, and I would always say, I, I can't tell you how many times I would say, what words are going to come out of your mouth? And they would say things like, oh, well, I would ask the team, eh, no, you're telling me what you would say. I want to know, like, what, 
Because without that, well, we would run casualty drills in the engine room, which is kind of what was reminding me of this, where we'd have fire, flooding, locusts, all, well, all kinds of disasters, nuclear meltdown. And as soon as the casualty started, I would look at the face of the engineering officer of the watch, who this is the, like the doctor in charge. And if, if I would look at the person's eyes, if the eyes went down, like they were looking for a book or something, I would just say stop, because that would be a disaster. If the eyes were unfocused, like they were looking all, like, no, nah, it would be a disaster. If the eyes went straight to like the key indication for, okay, is this flooding? Is it a steam line rupture? What kind of thing is going on here? And they were locked. Then I would say, okay, now we have a chance. <laughs> and, 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 but over and over and over again, the procedure doesn't tell you what words to say in, in the Navy. It tells you things like, well, most of them don't. Some of them do. But most of them say things like, you know, isolate, for example, isolate the source of the flooding. Well, you can't just get on the announcement system and say, isolate the source of the flood. Like, that doesn't do anything. <laughs> you have to give orders to shut specific valves or, or shut specific valves. So uh, we would over and over again talk about, that exactly. Yeah, I love that. Uh, okay, where are you standing? What are you going to say? Mm -hmm. I think um, creating a sense of we, I, if there's time, I think it would be super valuable to connect. The first thing is to connect. Do you mean connect with the people in the room? And yeah, sort of hi, hi I'm Dan. Let's sure. Go. And then just say your name as we go around, pop up and say your name and your role or something like that. Or maybe it's on our name tags or something like that. And, and I mean, obviously it's a very time urgent situation, so you can't like, well, it depends, right? I mean, there are times when you run into a room and the person's already in cardiac arrest and there's already somebody doing CPR. And yeah. often in that case you run in and the question is who is in charge. Yeah. And then the answer, if, which usually is nobody says anything, which then becomes, I am Dan, I am in charge. This yes. is what we're doing. You know, and yeah. because you have to sort of use that level of things. Like we were talking earlier about the leadership ladder and, and parts of it sort of need to be deployed immediately to get things going. Yeah. But there's also times, for instance, so I, I was working at a hospital and it was my first day, my first case, didn't know anybody, hadn't even met all the team yet. And a, a code three trauma comes in, meaning this is a person who is very sick that is going to need a lot of work and a lot of attention. Um, and so we were gathered in the room and we had about two seconds before the patient came in. And so you have that, that one or two minutes to be like, all right, folks, hey, you don't know me, but I'm Dan. We're going to talk more later about sort of what my style is, but here's what we're going to do today. Who are you? What's your specialty? And so yeah. you do have that ability to sort of do it in, in a lot of cases. That's smart. That's, I think that's, I think that's good. Um, I mean, you can definitely set that. I'm not saying don't necessarily do that. It's a, it's a pickup team, but really at the higher level, like what are the pro, like does the team expect that? And are we training all the teams in the hospital that, so, so if they say, oh, well, Dr. Dan, he takes feedback well. And if I think the patient's turning yellow from cause A, not cause B, and I tell Dr. Dan that, is he going to rip my head off? But then Dr. David is a different kind of person. That's not going to work. Right, right. Because then the team's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And, and so uh, there's, so we, the way you produce a quality automobile is not by putting a bunch of inspectors at the end of the line and then throwing all the defects in the scrap heap. It's by making sure the paint nozzles and the paint spray and the baking times and the, and the robot that assembles the windshield, that those things are all working in peak condition and they've minimized whatever variability they have in the process. But if we don't spend attention to the process, if we don't take control of the process, then we have to take control of the outcomes. And if you take control, you define the process for the team and you have consistent process. So I'm not saying about it, it give drug A or drug B. That will come out. That decision will come out correctly if the process is designed. You have quality decisions as an output. So the factory produces cars, the hospital does medical and decisions. So we want quality decisions consistently because we control the process by which decisions get made. 
I want to be mindful of our time and wrap this up. I, I thank you so much. Um, we always end with a challenge, which is for anybody listening to this who needs to perform better under pressure, what is it that you want them to do differently tomorrow? One thing that we could all do is I call it getting behind, getting out from behind your own eyeballs. We're, our programming is that I view the world from me inside my, from the focal plane of whatever my eyeballs are. And so if I don't think about it, I'm like looking here and I'm looking there. It's the perspective by which I'm viewing the world. And what I would try and do when I would start feeling, I was starting to talk faster, my respiration level was going up, my palms were starting to get sweaty. I felt sort of like this closing in tunnel vision, loss of perspective of what was going on to the left and the right of me. I would take my eyeballs and I put them over there and I'd look back at me as a, I'd be, become a spectator to myself. And I would try and create some, I would just separate. And then I would look at myself and I was like, you're a dumbass. Why are you doing that? Why are you not listening to your team? Why are you getting so wrapped up and having the right answer? Why are you so emotionally invested in the, the score here? Uh, and, and why is that getting in the way of you truly being able to see what's going on? And, and I would see, I could see myself from afar. And uh, sometimes I would push, cast my mind into the future and then I would look back on today. But, but sometimes, like if it was in the moment, like in the OR, I can imagine I would just put my eyeballs on the side of the room looking at myself. Uh, if it was a longer term thing, sometimes we'd, we'd say, hey, what, what would my future self want my current self to do in this situation? These are like, okay, should I just do it myself or get, the, you know, see that the team thinks those kind of things. So get out of your head, put your eyeballs on the corner of the wall, look back at yourself. The trick is you need a circuit breaker. So as you're getting sucked into that vortex, because there's a sweet spot you are aware and then you're in it and then you have no more control because it's control <laughs> so yeah try that let me know how it goes awesome david thank you so much cheers mate okay folks that brings us to the end of this conversation i hope you enjoyed it i hope you found something useful that you can use next time you find yourself in an emergency or a crisis Again, if you want to dig deeper into a lot of the concepts that we covered here, sign up for the Emergency Mind newsletter, Knowledge Under Pressure. It is free and it is awesome. You can join by going to www.emergencymind.com slash sign up. Also, as a reminder, our mission here at the Emergency Mind is to dig into lessons around applying knowledge under pressure, not to provide medical advice. Our opinions, as expressed on this podcast or elsewhere, are our own and not necessarily those of our employers or the hospitals at which we work. So keep up the good work, keep training, and good luck out there.